So how can we keep track of what we're teaching if we don't just start at one point and work steadily through it? If we're really teaching responsibly to students, it does feel very random. Some groups might need a, a lesson in coordinating conjunctions to join sentences, and other groups may really need how to spell there. And why is it that our kids go through high school and don't know how to spell there? Why is it? Is it because nobody's teaching it? People blame the younger grades for all kinds of problems, but those younger grades are teaching it. They're teaching kids how to spell there, and the kids are learning it and then going to the next grade and not spelling it correctly. How do we keep track of what we've taught, and how do we teach it in such a way that the students actually learn it? and it goes in and becomes a permanent part of their thinking processes. How do we do those two things? And so, what I have for you today takes care of those two things. Social interaction plays an integral role in the formation of thought. That speech becomes inner speech, inner thought. We hear it on the outside and then it goes internal. You can hear people's voices in your head. That's how it works. But they have to be outside first in order for them to go internal. Can't just read it, can't just think about it. It has to be out here in our senses, physically airwaves, making patterns in our ears before it can become something internal. When you think about a mama and a baby, you be the baby, I'll be the mama. So you have to say who's playing what part. When you play house, when you play doctor, when you play cops and robbers, when you play anything, you have to establish who's doing what. That's proto-conversational formatting. A mama and a baby are together. At first, the baby doesn't say anything. The mom does both sides of the conversation. Oh, look at you. You're the cutest little thing ever. Where's your nose? There's your nose. That's right. It's your nose. And... And the baby's not saying anything. Baby's just watching, kind of focusing all around and looking at the mama. And the mama's doing both parts. And at some point, the baby chimes in. Oh, and where's your toe? Ah, that's right, there's your toe. The baby didn't say, there's my toe. The baby said, ah. But the mama treated it like conversation. That's how we transmit our culture to our young ones. It's in proto-conversational formatting, teaching them the format of conversations. If you have a child in your classroom and you say, thank you, and they don't answer, they did not get that proto-conversational formatting. It's not just manners, it's the entire transmission of culture. They haven't been taught to have the conversation. And we have to do that in our classrooms. All discourse is a continuation of some conversation. There is no piece of writing that just happened. It was a response to something someone said. That's every historical document is a response. Something came before it. Let's say when you yourself are writing you're writing something, and you're coming up on the word there. I was sitting there, and you're on the word sitting, and there is coming up. My thought is that you have, we have, a little mental conversation with ourselves so fast about choosing which there. We don't even hear it because it goes by so fast. We make our decision and we write that choice of the there without even slowing down. We have that conversation so fast we don't hear it go by because it's gone so internal that it's the speed of thought. Our students don't know those conversations. They have something else in their heads. I wish Pixar would do a little inside-out version of what students' voices are going on inside their heads when they're making a grammatical choice. It would be things like, well, we haven't used this there in a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn to use that there. Or it might be, God, please guide my hand and choose the right one. 
Or it might be, what there? I don't see any other one but this one. You know, but we have a whole different set of thinking conversations. And so if we want students to learn for once and for all, we need to transmit to them the mental conversations of grammatical choice. And the only way we can transmit a conversation is like we do with babies, like we do when we're teaching anybody how to do something. We have to teach them the conversations of grammatical choices. They have to be out loud, and they have to be systematic. They cannot happen once. They have to be repeated until those conversations do go internal. Stephen, would you read this example sentence? Sure. They're my friends. And how do you spell there? T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E. Now, if I said to Stephen, I don't think that's right, he would say back to me. No, I'm pretty sure I'm right. And if I said, no, I'm sorry, Stephen, that's not right. He would prove it to me by well, just reading this sentence. Go ahead. They are my friends. Oh, you're right. I know. Just by switching out, <laughs> just by switching out the word for the proof word. That's a proof word. And so that's exactly how we teach them this conversation. All they need to know is the proof word and the code. The underline means I made this grammatical choice on purpose. And the proof word above it in parentheses means, and it's correct, and I can prove it. Two or three of those, and we're done. It's painless. It takes three minutes total around a, grammar, a, a journal entry. It doesn't cost a lot of time. It doesn't cost but three minutes to transmit our grammar conversations. They go in, they stay forever.